Um, this is our agenda here for today. And, and the major topic that we're going to be talking about, it really are vaccines in North Carolina and how we are getting these all important life saving vaccines out to people in an equitable way. And we're really looking forward to hearing from our expert presenters, Ariel Ford and Christy Snugs, the director and deputy director, respectively, for the Division of Child Development and Early Education here in North Carolina. We thank them so much for all the work that they have been doing and continue to do for our children and child care teachers and others here in our state. And Yasmin Garcia Rico, who is also with North Carolina DHHS, um, as a Latino community liaison, and I apologize if I have not, uh, Yasmin, when you go, hopefully you can give your full title and correct title there. I apologize. And then, as always, we're going to have our legislative update from Ashley Perkinson, the NC Child Lobbyist, and Tiffany Gladney, uh, our policy director. Um, prior to getting into any of the uh, agenda, though, it has been about one year since the beginning of the pandemic really in earnest here in our country and across the world. Um, and really, as we all know, our lives have changed dramatically over the past year and we've lost nearly 12,000 North Carolinians to COVID-19. So I was just hoping we could take a moment of silence um, to remember and think about them and then we'll continue. All right, thank you. Um, but the good news is, is that, you know, help is on the way. We're moving forward, we're making progress. It's really miraculous, uh, the level of progress we're making in some ways. And it doesn't take away the pain or um, belittle what we've been through or minimize what we have to continue to do to keep our communities safe. But um, I hope we're all feeling a little bit more hopeful about the days ahead. And um, this conversation around vaccinations, et cetera, I think will, will hopefully help reassure us even more. So um, we would like to get started um, with uh, Christy and Ariel. I'm not sure if Ariel has joined us as of yet. I made it, yes. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Good, All right. good to so be here with you. Yeah. Yeah, well, thanks so much for joining us, Ariel, as the director of NC, uh, DCDEE and Christy, the deputy director. We really appreciate your, you all being with us and sharing. And we're hoping you could just talk a little bit more about um, vaccination rollout and other issues related to early education here in North Carolina. And I will let you all take it away. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'll begin. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, go right ahead. <laughs> I'll just begin um, and introduce myself for a second. And then I think Christy and I are going to kind of tag team this conversation, but it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, we are so grateful that childcare was prioritized in the vaccination rollout, they are they are frontline essential employees and central infrastructure that has remained open throughout the pandemic. They have not closed at all. So the fact that our governor and our state recognizes the importance of them as um, as as some of the first to be vaccinated outside of medical and uh, specific age targets is truly remarkable. I mean, it really speaks highly to the level of investment our advocates have put into raising up childcare as an essential component of our state. Um, so, so just really proud that North Carolina has a history of, of supporting childcare and that that has continued through the pandemic. Um, I'm going to let Christy speak to our vaccination rollout plan, but I just wanted to say thank you to all of you for the efforts that you've made, that you continue to make. Child care has been, I've been in the field since I began working basically, and so the way that we support our educators, small businesses, and supports um, is, is is just, it makes me really proud to be a North Carolinian and to be in early childhood in North Carolina. So I'm gonna, after I've just emoted, uh, I will turn it over to Christy to share some about the, the vaccine rollout. And then I will, we will kind of go back and forth tag teaming and answering any questions you might have. 
Christy, partner in crime, take it away. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Christy Snugs, and I'm the deputy director with the division. And I am thrilled to be here. Thank you for having us. I do want to speak just a few moments about uh, how we rolled out the vaccine uh, plan in North Carolina for our child care providers. Um, and let me just say, I want to echo what Ariel said. We were thrilled on February 10th when the governor came out and said, child care is going to be um, um, put into the group of essential workers. And not only are there going to be essential workers, but we're going to prioritize child care along with our public school partners uh, two weeks prior to the rest of the essential workers. And so, and give them two weeks to actually go out and get the vaccine before we open up group three to all frontline essential workers. Because I too want to thank all of you and anyone that you know and the groups that you work with um, for childcare remaining our unsung heroes throughout this pandemic because they have been there and been open throughout the entire time. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to build on our tremendous partnerships and, um, with all of our community partners to really form a support network for our childcare providers so that they could go out and get their vaccine. And we did that by approaching it from a, a supply and demand, demand and supply type of um, a focus. We used a four-pronged approach, and what we did is we worked with our child care resource and referral agencies across the state to really think about the demand side. Those child care um, resource and referral agencies reached out to all of our child care providers individually uh, or to each of the programs individually to make sure that they had a contact and knew what was going on. We, they asked that the administrators at those sites or at the family child care home to give a list of employees and whether or not they were interested in getting the vaccine. The whole point of that was so that we could connect them to events that were going to take place in their local communities. We did ask for some information, it was not required, but we wanted to get the information that we needed, contact information especially, like telephone numbers and email addresses so that we then could share that with vaccine providers. And when those events happened, they could be pre-registered or get registered to go and get their vaccine as quickly as possible. So the child care resource and referral agencies really helped us to understand the demand that was needed uh, for the vaccine in the child care community. But then we also um, used our partnerships with our local partnerships for children, the North Carolina partnership, as well as our uh, 75 local partnerships across the state. And they really helped us on the supply side. So what they did is their role was they worked with the vaccine providers, whether that was local health departments, health systems, hospitals, and they helped to find or set up events or coordinate events so that um, they would, there would be set aside times or slots for childcare providers. And then they work so collaboratively with the RNRs, many times they're in the same agency anyway, but they work together to make sure that information got back to the RNR network, who then shared it with the child care providers. Now, that was two of the prongs. The reason we did that is we knew that those providers work long hours, long days. You know, they're um, not a traditional, they work at least a 12 hour day in most cases, and they were maybe not available when normal vaccine events were happening. So the partnerships also helped us to coordinate specific and special events for child care providers across the state. But we had two other components as well. The third prong was that we used our or leveraged our child care health consultants across the state who have been very vital to uh, answering questions and providing support to child care providers throughout the pandemic. We leveraged them to do education of our child care um, workforce prior to uh, rolling out this uh, supply and demand approach. So what we did is uh, we did um, a number of webinars 
for child care providers to really uh, give them uh, an understanding of the science behind the vaccine and also to understand the rollout plan and what was about to happen. We had um, over 100 to 200 people on all of those trainings. We even uh, did some in the evening. Uh, so child care providers that were tied up during the day could hear it firsthand. And we also, the child care health consultants also did private or um, they scheduled personal uh, trainings for individual child care providers or companies or programs in local communities as well. Uh, but we wanted to make sure everyone was educated on the science, that they knew that the vaccine was safe, that it was effective, and that it was free. Those were our three main points, is that we wanted child care providers to understand that. So the child care health consultants really helped us with the education of our workforce related to the vaccine and the vaccine rollout. And then our fourth prong was um, our agency at DCDEE. We used our um, existing child care consultants and regulatory staff who already had trusted relationships with our child care providers, and they became sources of information. So we really became the information hub. So if there were questions, we set up a special a unit that answered um, phone. We had a direct phone line that came in, as well as email address um, for just questions related to the rollout of the vaccine to the child care community. I'm happy to say, you know, we planned for the, uh, uh, to answer as many questions that came in, but we had very few questions, which meant to us that the, the network and the support system that we set up was working. Once we initiated that four-pronged approach, within a week, we had touched almost 90 to 95 percent of the child care providers across the state. They were already aware of what was going on. And just to give you a brief understanding of where we are right now, we have about 40% of our child care population that have had their first dose or the Johnson & Johnson, their only dose of the vaccine um, and or have an appointment. So about 40% have had their first dose or have an appointment. Another 20% are still a little hesitant. They're still making decisions. We're providing additional information for them. Um, we're uh, using our healthcare consultants to answer any of their questions and really using that network that I talked to you about just a few moments ago. And then there's about 40% of our population or that uh, childcare population that we're really not sure uh, where they are or where they stand. And that are those are the ones that we are really zeroing in on right now. Our, um, that support network is, especially with the RNRs are reaching out. They're trying to answer questions. Um, one of the things that you need to understand throughout this, while we set up this support network, an individual could still go and choose to get their vaccine on their own without any of that support system. So a lot of those 40% we do believe are probably um, already vaccinated or have appointments, uh, but we are really trying to reach out and to provide information. So that's just a short synopsis of what we did and how we supported our childcare workforce. And I'll be glad, um, Ariel and I, to answer any additional questions that you might have. Christy, that was, this is Ariel again, that was an awesome overview. And the, the only thing I would add is that part of the reason we wanted them to make individual, CCRNR to make individual phone calls was because of equity. So we know that childcare programs that have a large administrative staff have someone monitoring the email all the time. So they know the second the division sends out an email, but we didn't want our smaller programs in our family childcare homes to have less access to the vaccine because they have their administrator is also a classroom teacher. Uh, so that is why it was really important to us that the phone call um, connection was made in addition to emails so that we were trying to lean in toward our value of equity and the execution of vaccines in an equitable way. So that just, just to highlight that it's not a perfect system, but that's one of the ways we were trying to really, um, trying to support our childcare providers who have less access to administrative staff and supports. Thank you for those comments, Ariel. I apologize for not including that. Thanks so much. 
That's wonderful. It's a great overview, Christy and Aaron. It's so good to just hear about those four major prongs, all the steps you all have been taking, the progress that's being made. And uh, I wanted to ask Fawn now if we have any questions in the chat, perhaps. I'm not seeing questions coming in the chat. Folks, if you have questions, please feel free to go ahead and drop those in the chat for Christy and Ariel. But want to lift up what Michelle is saying, like the level of coordination and hustle to reach all of these people is so impressive and just really speaks to the network that y'all have built over time and just the amount of work and forethought to execute all of this. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Absolutely. And I imagine that obviously a lot of what you all were talking about too with outreach and trying to achieve equity, you know, by doing that will tie in also to what Yasmin is going to talk to us about. And so uh, perhaps if we don't have those other questions right now, um, Christy and Ariel, we really appreciate it. If you're able to stay on and, and you know, for the, for the remainder of the call, we welcome you to. Otherwise, if any other questions come in for you, we will certainly pass those along. Um, Thank you so right. much for having us. We, we're thrilled. And I do want to just reiterate that we have a wonderful system um, of early, ch early childhood system in North Carolina, and we appreciate the partnership that all of you provide every day. Wonderful. Take care. Um, thanks and so much, now I'd like to introduce Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just, this is Ariel. Just thanks so much, everybody. And just ditto what Christy said. And um, please let us know if you have more questions or ideas to, to make it even better. Sounds great. Thank you again for joining us. And um, now I'd like to introduce once again, Yasmin Garcia Rico, who uh, has been a long, long time been an advocate here in North Carolina around various causes and, and, and the people of, of Alamance County and our state and is now working with the governor's office and North Carolina DHHS around um, some equity issues related to the Latino community and uh, is also a, an MSW, a fellow MSW, I believe. So um, yay, you know, Tom, Tom's always scared <laughs> about how many MSWs we have floating around, but um, uh, always love to see that. And so Yasmin, I will let you take it away, please. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I was just remembering this morning that I joined this meeting a few months ago um, to talk about the, the work I was doing in Alamance County. Um, and at that point, we were talking about testing and immediate response to the needs of, of the community, um, basic needs that were not being met uh, because of the pandemic and how hard uh, it, it was hitting uh, African-American and Latinx communities in particular. Um, so I'm glad to be back with more updates and uh, now in a new role. Um, I joined the Department of Health and Human Services seven weeks ago. I just checked the calendar um, and I'm the new director for Latinx uh, and Hispanic policy and strategy. So it is a, a very exciting role for me. I feel like it's bringing um, together all my experience, personal experience, professional experience, and of course, that uh, social work uh, training as well. Um, so I'll jump right in uh, because there is a lot of information that I can share and I would love to hear questions. Um, if there are questions, Adam, if you can help me keep track of the chat just to, to make sure that I'm not um, looking down too much. Um, but yep. as we know, we are in vaccination and um, um, as we you know, started this meeting remembering what we've been through for, for the last year, um, I was at the FEMA uh, site in Greensboro uh, two days ago, and I, I was so emotional to see people actually getting vaccinated um, in our community, in our state. Um, it, has, it has been happening for a few weeks, uh, but just being a year after and knowing that we are, we, we can see the light at the end um, where we can go back and, and be with family members, with loved ones. Uh, and that is very important for the Latinx community. I was excited to hear that the CDC mentioned that if you are vaccinated, you can be around other people. Um, so I hope that is a, an incentive and a motivation for, for those who are still not sure. Um, so I'll share a little bit about where we are. And um, some of that might, might have already been shared at some point uh, before in other meetings, but we are vaccinating group one, two, and three, which includes medical uh, health workers, uh, which is group one, uh, people who are 65 years and older, group two, 
and people who are uh, frontline essential workers um, that, that started last week. That is group, group three. Um, and just yesterday, I believe, <laughs> um, the, the governor and secretary Cohen announced that beginning on March 17, people in group four who have medical conditions uh, and are at a higher risk um, can start to get vaccinated, they are eligible. And the, the rest of group four, um, which includes the rest of uh, frontline essential workers will be eligible on April 7. So um, there, there are a lot of questions about who is on group uh, uh, three in frontline essential workers. Um, there's a lot of those details in our website. Our website is completely um, available in Spanish for the community and my background um, helps people rem uh, to remember uh, what the website is, which is um, vacunate.nc.gov. Uh, and that information is in avail available in Spanish. All the tools, all the uh, materials that we have are available in Spanish. Um, one of the main questions from the Latino community is construction workers during group four um, and uh, other frontline essential workers in group three include um, people that are working in the fields, farm workers, poultry plant workers, uh, restaurant workers. Um, I know our teachers are part of that group as well, but there's many more um, positions, many more jobs that are also available. So I encourage you to visit our website if you have um, any specific um, questions regarding that. Um, and there is a lot of work happening uh, to reach out the Latinx community. That is my focus. Uh, even before I joined DHHS, there were other, uh, other people who have been uh, helping the department to make sure that we're thinking and addressing uh, some of the issues that are impacting the community. Um, as I mentioned in my last visit uh, to this group, there is a lot of barriers that um, the community is facing, language access, documentation status, um, and, and the list goes on, on, on and on, um, health insurance. Those barriers were there before the pandemic, and now we're seeing with the pandemic how everything is exacerbated. So it is important for our department to keep those barriers in mind so that we address them as much as possible to close the gap and to make sure that we uh, get to the community uh, and get those vaccines in their arms. Uh, the reality is that the Latinx community is the lowest um, in terms of vaccination rates in our state. Um, and, and that reflects as well across the country, um, unfortunately. So a lot of work is being done. Um, I'm glad to be on this role and I'm working uh, 14 hour days to, to make sure that we cover um, many needs um, in you know, all throughout communities. I know that there's a lot of partner organizations that are doing the same to make sure that we reach the community. Um, I can share a little bit more about how I'm engaging with communities and what we are doing. Um, we are embedding equity in all our strategies. And of course, we, we have to think specifically about what are those additional barriers for the Latinx community. Uh, two important things that I, I like to mention is that um, people do not need to present an identification to get a vaccine. And we know that usually, if people are asked for a driver's license or a state issue ID, uh, they are immediately gonna feel, um, you know, discouraged from accessing the vaccine. So people can access the vaccine without an ID. They do not need to have health insurance. The vaccine is free and available for everyone. And lastly, um, information is kept uh, confidential. And so if you get your vaccine, no information is gonna be shared with ICE, with immigration. That information is kept confidential. And actually what we sent to the CDC only includes the year of birth, the first three digits of the zip code, and then demographics, including uh, gender and race and ethnicity. And so that data is very important for us to collect. We are actually one of the first number one states um, across the country in collecting that data. And that is what is helping us to make sure that we are uh, keeping a loop on what the gaps are and making sure we continue to put more efforts uh, to bring those numbers up. Um, and we're doing a lot of work as well in terms of uh, going where communities are. 
as a social worker, I know there are other fellow social workers here. We know that we need to meet people where they are. We are uh, encouraging vaccine providers to partner with community-based organizations and groups to host vaccination clinics. There are amazing examples all throughout the state of, of this kind of work happening. Um, I can mention a couple. Um, Amexcan uh, is helping people to register for appointments. Um, I know Latin 19, along with many other community organizations, are putting together different clinics at um, La Cooperativa Latina, which is the Latino Credit Union, and different other places. So those events, just as testing, are going to be crucial so that people come to a place where they feel comfortable. Um, actually, this week, uh, my week has been crazy even more because I'm leading an effort in Alamance County to bring FEMA vaccination some of those vaccines to Alamance County. So starting next Friday, we'll have vaccines uh, on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday for three weeks. Those will be the first doses. We'll have three, 300 doses per day uh, for, for four days, for three weeks. And then the following set um, will be second doses. And the last two probably will be one dose vaccines. So uh, we are really working hard um, to make sure that we are thinking about equity and, and making decisions that will impact those numbers. Uh, for the Greensboro vaccination event that started this Wednesday, we set aside 50% of the doses so that we um, intentionally work with community-based um, organizations, with churches, community health workers, to make sure that those appointments were filled by um, communities of color and, and historically marginalized populations. A lot of work happened. A lot of partners came through for us. I apologize. Um, a lot of partners came through for us because we we were um, invited to do this FEMA event a day, you know, a couple of weeks in advance at uh, the most, and then we had to turn around and fill those appointments with the people that we know are usually not um, the the first ones to get those appointments because of internet access, because of not having the time to sit on the phone and wait. Um, Adam, make let, let me know if I'm like going over time. <laughs> um, uh, no, you're doing a great job, Yasmin. Maybe another, maybe one more minute and then we'll okay. have questions. Okay. I'll, I'll power through. So there's <laughs> a lot of efforts um, and I'm happy to, you know, continue conversations with people. Uh, addressing language access is very important and we know that that is one major barrier. We are uh, partnering with many community-based organizations to make sure that they help us get the word out and also uh, been working with the Hispanic Federation to um, answer phone calls in Spanish. We have different ways that people can get those appointments, uh, but they also are, are supporting a lot of these efforts around FEMA events in Alamance County, Winston-Salem, and um, in Greensboro. Um, so there is a lot I can say. The, the Latinx community is very diverse. Um, there, there is a lot of, of different things that we need to address. Farm worker population is also very important. The North Carolina Farm Worker Health Program is leading those efforts. There is a statewide uh, initiative and uh, farm workers are actually starting to get vaccinated all throughout the state. Um, there is a lot of materials um, one video that they're watching on their way here so that they hear more about the vaccine and its safetyness. Um, and we're doing a lot of other things um, in Spanish, uh, vaccine 101 presentations so that the trusted messengers can take this information to their communities. We have a bilingual newsletter. We have um, also uh, a meeting or a Facebook Live conversation with Secretary Coin, all in Spanish. And for those of you who are on the other channel listening to the Spanish, uh, I'm so glad that technology allows us to do this. So the next one will be at the end of the month and we'll be addressing um, again, some of the concerns that the community has. And so I'm gonna stop right there because I, I've been talking a lot, but would love to um, you know, continue this conversation or answer some questions as well. Thank you so much, Yasmin. No, it's, it's that it was a wonderful overview. And when you're talking about all this, I mean, just the words, you know, public health and equity just, you know, were kind of booming out of me because it's, it is really amazing the work that's being done. And from what I've seen too here in North Carolina, a lot of that work is paying off with who is receiving the vaccines. I know we're not where we totally want to be, but um, kudos to you and your colleagues and every and everybody else. 
I, I could ask all kinds of questions. I'll leave, I'm gonna leave space for others. But I guess one question I would have among many would be, are there particular regions of North Carolina that you, I mean, you talked about the farm worker population, mainly down East, I'm assuming, but I know that's all over the place. But are there certain regions that now you're, you're really starting to focus in on? I would say all throughout. Um, I weekly I have meetings with coalitions. Uh, there's different different coalitions all throughout the state in eastern, western North Carolina. There's a lot going on between the triangle and the triad. So I'm engaging in those conversations with the stakeholders. Uh, a lot of anything in Spanish to be, um, I'm I'm there. <laughs> I'm talking to the media and we're working closely with Kepasa to make sure that we bring this information to them. Um, connecting with churches and, and a lot of the strategy as well. There is a, a, a lot of work going on at the HHS in terms of equity and making sure that we are uh, adjusting to make sure we address the needs. And I'm part of all those conversations. And so I would say in terms of the state, we are thinking about every community. Uh, vaccines get allocated in a very uh, specific way to reach those equity goals. Um, to share a little bit more about the FEMA event in Alamance County, our goal is to have 75% of those vaccines going to uh, communities of color. And so there is a, a, high, a high standard of, of things that we are trying to accomplish. Um, and on the ground, our partners are those vaccine providers and community-based organizations and leaders, uh, because the reality is that there is a lack of trust in healthcare, not just from the Latino community, but other communities as well. And so being aware of that and working in collaboration with those that have the trust is the key to make sure that uh, we can get those vaccines in, in people's arms the, the faster way possible. And that education as well, because we want to make sure that they know all, all the information they need uh, for them to feel comfortable coming in and, and getting their vaccine. Thank you. Um, Fawn, do we have any other questions? I'm not seeing questions coming in, but a lot of thanks. So um, Yasmin, thank you so much for everything that you're doing. It's wonderful to see and um, yeah, very, very grateful for you. Thank you all for, for having me and for this space. Absolutely, thank you. Um, now, moving forward, uh, after the wonderful updates, giving us all you know better perspective on what's happening with the vaccines, let's talk about what's been going on with policy this week at the state level and also the federal level. There was a piece of legislation passed that y'all may have heard about. Um, but let's go ahead and I am going to pass it along to our lobbyist, Ashley Perkinson. All right, thank you, Adam, and uh, good morning, everyone. So we do have an update, as, as I'm sure all of you have heard, um, but this week the governor and the legislature came together to, to agree on uh, an in-person learning uh, bill for students to, to get back into school in person. It's Senate Bill 220, and that bill passed the legislature unanimously. The governor signed the bill. If you blinked, you missed it. It happened so quickly. And the governor and uh, both Speaker Moore and uh, Senator Berger got together for a press conference um, to an announce that agreement, and some of the other bill sponsors were there as well. So the the way this bill is written, um, it would require all schools to provide in-person learning. The legislation says within 21 days after the legislation is enacted. So looking at the beginning of April, uh, it does require plan A, that's minimal social distancing for all elementary schools and plan A or B for middle schools uh, throughout the state. It does give the governor the ability to, um, to act to close certain school districts, but not schools across the state. So it's a much more narrow authority. Um, it also provides that schools that have the plan A option, which this will be all elementary schools and then with the, the middle schools, either the plan A or, or B, that they will connect with DHHS and um, let them know what their plan is. And also the bill provides funding uh, to Duke University to help with um, analytics and, and COVID data information. So Again, um, it was a unanimous vote and uh, the governor signed the bill. So we will likely not be talking about this legislation next week. I know we've talked about it for the last few weeks, um, but good to see resolution with both the legislature and the governor on this issue. 
Um, also want to mention, unless there are questions, any questions on that bill, I, I do want to mention students still have the option for remote learning. And also I noticed uh, the, the language about accommodations for teachers that was in the house version, don't believe is in this, this last version. So I did notice that that was a change from some of the earlier versions of the bill. Um, but um, it like a couple of pages if you want to look at uh, the language specifically in Senate Bill 220. Um, also, as Adam mentioned, of course, uh, President Biden signed the American Rescue Plan, the $1.9 trillion uh, legislation, and want to highlight some of the key elements um, of that legislation. Um, of course, uh, we have the um, uh, the support um, to, I think, around 90% of Americans of the $1,400 check um, that will be going out to around 90% of households, extending the $300 weekly federal boost to unemployment benefits through August, um, sending $350 billion to state and local governments, um, allocating $130 billion to fully reopen schools and colleges, um, supporting uh, renters um, uh, throughout uh, this pandemic with uh, $30 billion in support uh, to help uh, uh, renters and, and landlords weather economic losses, uh, devoting $50 billion for small business assistance, um, around $160 billion for vaccine uh, development and, and distribution, uh, and extending pr uh, premium subsidies for people who buy health insurance on their own instead of getting it from an employer or government program. So um, a lot of um, supports uh, in that legislation and, and probably a lot of you on this call have been following it very closely this week. Um, so look forward to, to hearing your questions and, and comments, but you know, very busy time at the legislature, obviously um, big news uh, coming out of Congress um, with the $1.9 Billion dollar plan and North Carolina, I believe, is is slated to receive around five billion dollars um, from that package, which would be an incredible uh, boost, uh, an infusion of, of funding to the state. So a lot uh, of developments this week, and um, Tiffany will share some additional. With but before she does, I do want to give a shout out to um, our amazing committee with the introduction of House Bill 272, Rise Health Standards for Lead. This is an issue that he has worked on um, for, for many years um, in, in changing what is allowable for the, the levels of lead in our child care centers from 15 parts per billion. The goal was to five parts per, per billion. The bill includes 10 parts per, per billion, but it is a, a step in the right direction. So good to see some uh, you know, great sponsors on that legislation. I know Tiffany's up. I would say yes. Kudos, yay, Tom and Vicki and everyone on that lead bill. And kudos to Salisbury's own representative Harry Warren for being the primary sponsor. That's right. That you know, this is the perfect tee up actually from Ashley and Adam. Um, there was so much happening on Jones Street that we really had to divide up the remainder of the updates into our pillars. So when it comes to health, we actually saw some movement with Senate Bill 93, um, assisting North Carolina families in crisis. So this bill um, would allow for parents whose children have temporarily been taken into custody to keep their Medicaid benefits, specifically when it comes to substance abuse, mental health, or medical treatment. Uh, while their children are in foster care. So we did see this bill move um, into Senate appropriations. So that's where that's headed next. Um, and it does have bipartisan support, which is um, really important these days. So one of the um, upsides to COVID has been, it's really put a spotlight on the need for telehealth and more support and infrastructure when it comes to telehealth. And that is evident by a lot of telehealth legislation proposals. So we saw that with um, House Bill 144, and that's garnering a lot of um, interest this, this week specifically. And that one is the dental telehealth bill. So that's going to be really important and afford a lot of folks, especially in our rural communities, um, increased access to quality, affordable dental and oral health care, as well as uh, the total body. 
So then Ashley touched on the huge victory with House Bill 272 revising the health standard for lead, which is, um, I think all of us are going to go dance a little bit, tap dance in our kitchens after this call to just really celebrate that victory because that is huge for um, North Carolina babies. So when it comes to family financial security, um, Senator Heiss actually with bipartisan co-sponsors as well um, filed Senate Bill 181 reinstate earned income tax credit um, legislation. So this would just reinstate the state's earned income tax credit program. So this bill right now has been referred to the Senate Rules and Operations Committee. So we're just waiting to see some movement there and a date for um, it to be calendared in that committee. We also saw Senate Bill 114, so DES COVID modifications. So this piece of legislation would um, reinstate the requirement for the work search uh, requirement for unemployment benefits. And it would also postpone a planned unemployment tax hike for businesses, extend COVID related benefits through the end of the year and allow people to stack benefit periods. So then when it comes to juvenile justice, uh, we saw a lot of movement this week when it came to juvenile justice. So raise the age um, is a hot topic and it continues to be this session. So we saw House Bill 261, raise the minimum age of juvenile jurisdiction was filed and assigned a committee. So this act would modify the definition of a juvenile delinquent from at least six years of age to 10 years of age. Um, so we're waiting to see some more motion on this bill as well. So all of these bills that Ashley, Adam, and I have referenced, we are tracking all of these. And of course, we'll keep you guys updated as they move and progress or um, stall, whatever the case may be. So we also saw House Bill 225, prosecutorial discretion slash juveniles, which would allow prosecutors to decide how to charge juveniles, specifically with class A through G felonies and offenses. Offenses. And then there was House Bill 173, separate juvenile justice and adult corrections. So this legislation, the title is pretty self-explanatory, separating juvenile and adult corrections. Um, it was filed earlier this month, so we're just waiting for it to be assigned to committee and to get calendar at respective committee. So when it comes to child welfare, um, we saw House Bill 205, which would require public schools to provide students with information and resources on child abuse and neglect, including sexual abuse. Um, on the early education and child care forefront, we saw some bipartisan legislation this week um, to increase appropriations for Smart Start, and that's House Bill 226, the Smart Start Funds Bill. And that would increase funding to meet the needs for, of course, more children and families. Specifically, it would be $15 million for child care related activities, $7.5 million for family support activities, $3.75 million for health related activities, and $3.75 million for child care subsidies. So um, as with many things on Jones Street, Stuff starts out one way and ends up another way. So we'll see how this one fares this session. When it comes to child safety, we saw Senate Bill 69, the DMV licensing requirements slash outsource road test. So this bill was heard in Senate Commerce and Insurance Committee on Thursday. So this legislation has, you know, it's multifaceted, but it essentially in part wanted to change the state's graduated driver's licensing requirements by reducing the amount of supervised time uh, for teenage driver, that teenage drivers must complete um, from 12 months to six months. So due to some concerns from the insurance industries as well as some child safety organizations, including NC Child, they actually introduced a PCS that got the language revised to nine months. Um, but then last minute in committee, they decided to not vote 
on the PCS or the bill in itself. So we're waiting to see what will happen with this bill. Um, what's the next step for this piece of legislation? So then we have immigration and family separation. This was another big issue this week on Jones Street. So we saw um, Senate Bill 101 require cooperation with ICE 2.0. And it is exactly that. This is something that we have seen in prior sessions. Um, you know, this is legislation seeking to require local sheriff's departments to consult with Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, um, when an individual charged with certain offenses is in custody and their citizenship status is in question. Um, it would also require, you know, these judicial officials to hold a suspect in their local facilities for 48 hours or, or until ICE can resolve whatever that immigration status inquiry might be. Um, so, of course, this is a contentious, hot topic, an issue, um, and it was the same. Um, sheriffs from both sides of the argument came out in committee. Um, so this bill passed out of the Senate and is now headed to the House. And speaking of the House, we had House Bill 62, um, which is the Immigration Compliance and Join Ordinances. And this one passed out of the House um, and is on its way to the Senate. So this bill would put restraints on funding for cities that would consider themselves sanctuary cities if they impede on federal immigration investigations. So there are several pieces of legislation that have come out um, this week or this month, um, some of which we are very, very supportive of and very excited about, some of which we are very concerned about and we are working very hard to um, revise or um, kill, to be honest. So stay tuned for details um, as session continues. Thanks so much, Tiffany and Ashley. Um, Vaughn, do we have any questions that have popped up? I am not seeing questions yet in the chat box. Folks, if you have any questions for Tiffany and Ashley, please go ahead and enter them. Everyone's quiet today. Um, and yeah, I I'm not seeing anything, but I have an announcement when the time is right. So we'll just move. Okay. Ready. Well, I think we're at that, that point. Um, thanks everyone for joining us. Do we have any announcements before we adjourn? Fawn? Uh, I want to share that um, next, well, not next week, at the end of the month, we're gonna be releasing our 2021 county data cards. And um, last year, Quite a few of you um, as CAN organizations joined us to help release the county data cards. And um, this is a great opportunity to get out a lot of information about what's happening for kids in your county. Um, and you'll see that it covers many different areas, including early childhood, education, health and wellness. Great opportunity also to get the word out about what your organization is doing locally around these issues. So um, we'll have a toolkit. We would love for you to take part in this public release. And the toolkit will make it pretty easy for you. We'll have social media that you can use, infographics, a newsletter article you can use. So if you wanna be part of that, um, I'll drop a link into the chat box right now. You can just sign up and um, the official date for the release is March 23rd. Um, so we'll accept signups through March 18th. Just click the form to sign up your organization to take part and I will get you that toolkit right after March 18th. We would love to have you on board for that. Wonderful. Excited about this new rollout. Um, any other announcements? Hey, Adam, I see that uh, we have somebody raising their hand. Um, Ms. Pelter, do you want to uh, unmute yourself? Or do you want me? To, I don't know if I can do it. Someone might. I did. I don't know. I did it. Gotcha. Sorry. Um, House Bill 186, which was scheduled to be heard, heard by Judiciary 2 this week. Um, was not heard. This is a shared parenting bill that we've been working on for 12 years to try to keep both parents in the child's life after separation or divorce. And we are constantly foiled 
by Representative Sarah Stevens. She just refuses to hear our bills. She is a family lawyer. We know she has backing from the Family Law Council and I'm sure from the Bar Association. Anyway, we're doing what we can to try to have that bill reassigned because we just have way too many children without two parents, in particular without fathers. And family court is definitely gender biased. About 85% of the time, custody goes to mothers when they are perfectly loving, caring fathers who want to be in their kids' lives. And it would support mothers as well. It, shared parenting would give mothers more time to learn more, to earn more, and to relax. They all say they're stressed. But we need more support to get around Representative Sarah Stevens. I hate to be so incriminating, but she is the one who stops this every time we have a bill. So thank you for listening and hearing my gripes. Thank you, Ms. Peltzer. And that's House Bill 186? Correct. And who's the primary to... sponsor of that? Excuse me? Do you know who the primary bill sponsor is? Yes, the primary sponsor is Representative Garland Pierce. He's an okay. African American Baptist, I believe, from the east part of the state. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Um, I also just just really quickly for next week, next couple weeks, and maybe Fawn, you can help me out. Let's see, next week, Tiffany Gladney, our policy director, is going to be providing a budget 101, which is going to be really cool. I'm looking forward to that to get a refresher myself, kind of like how does the budget process work in theory? What are some major things we as advocates can keep an eye on? Um, then the week after that, we'll be, it'll be all about those county data cards as we get those launched. And then we will be taking Good Friday, April 2nd off, okay? So um, if there is nothing else, um, again, we'll be sharing an email this afternoon with this recording, and we really appreciate everyone for joining us. Have a great weekend. Thank you, you too.